the outpatient around 13.5 percent. Then in the year 2015, increased to be 17 percent. So before 2014, 15.4 percent. In patient, for example, uh, in the the basic one, the lower one, in patient in the national level, before JKN implement, implemented was only one percent utilization. Then increase to be one point one percent in the year 2014. Then the year 2015 to be one point seven percent. Next slide, please. Of course, then when we are talking about healthcare access and equality, too many JKN act as stepping stone to access healthcare. But the study shows that promising sign that JKN reduced inequality to healthcare access in each year since JKN was implemented, marked by the improvement in Gini ratio. And without JKN, you know, the National Social Economic Survey, for example, shows that the gap of healthcare utilization rate among rural, the, the blue line, and urban, next slide, urban, the green line, is narrowing, which suggests that healthcare inequality is uh, improving. Next slide, please. This is the financial sustainability. Of course, that the uh, sustaining pharmaceutical financing, it is, you know, also determining the sustainability of the program, but not only pharmaceutical, but product, but also health uh, interventions. And of course, now we are thinking about the new promotion prevention to be included in our benefit package. And of course, this will, uh, the thinking is will reduce the cost, but we do not know in the reality. And we are still now uh, have debating on included many uh, new prevention and promotion activities, for example, like screening, cancer screening, uh, diabetes mellitus uh, screening, and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. So we have the efforts to collect revenues by working and making collaboration with many uh, banks, and we are developing also in the co uh, collection of the contribution using automatic uh, saving deduction, financial technology, for example, like fintech platforms, JKN agents uh, across the country, also bank agents, uh, SMS reminders, and many type of the approach. Next slide. This, of course, that we are trying to develop to ensure that effective, efficient JKM benefit package uh, should be there. But uh, of course, when we are comparing some, uh, you know, countries, for example, like Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, you know, India. So that is the figure. For example, uh, the, you know, <clears throat> is the multiple, and the blue is the Ministry of Health, whether the Ministry of Health is there or not. That is comparing some of the country, and benefit package and payment. Uh, rate uh, in Indonesia set by the Minister of Health, and we are the operationalizing uh, agency who implementing the regulation set by the Ministry of Health. And the premium rate is a national consensus from multiple stakeholders, and of course it is not easy. Then BPJS Kesehatan is mostly in, uh, in charge of providing, contacting, contacting with uh, health facilities, and also to set up the payment method. Now we are using prospective payment method, for example, like a DRG uh, for paying the hospitals and also using the capitation for uh, primary healthcare. Next slide, please. So to ensure the high quality and affordable medical services, uh, pharmaceutical and medical devices, we also develop the Health Technology Assessment Committee in the Ministry of Health where they are doing some assessment whether the new drugs, new uh, medical devices is actually cost effective or not. And next slide, please. 
So, for example, in the year 2017, after doing technology assessment, PFAS ZUMAP and CITUSIMAP recommended to be delisted from JKN benefit package. Unfortunately, some uh, community members, uh, they are not happy. They were not happy and then challenged us to the court. Unfortunately, the court said that we should include it. Then in the year uh, 2018, trust to zoom up and to zoom up recommended to remain at least in JKN benefit package. And also almost the same thing in the year 2019-2020, the formosal fabrication uh, versus uh, Excel. Next slide, please. So now we are trying to, you know, increase the innovations and also breakthrough how our member administration before COVID, for example, in the one room, maybe can accommodate 200 up to 300 people are trying to solve their needs, administrative needs. For example, now in the one room, only around uh, less than 10 people, especially in BPJS brands. Next slide, please. This is also our other innovation, improving healthcare CKN program. So we are developing some kind of, uh, you know, new innovation, for example, like uh, mobile CKN and, uh, you know, consultation online. And more than 7 million people consultations uh, already done. And now, again, we make more, you know, a friendly user, especially for care center. Usually we use long numbers, for example, 1,500, 400, now only 165. And again, the improvement of health services policies during COVID-19 pandemic, including development of digital-based health services, as I mentioned, teleconsultation, and some telemedicine. And now we also uh, developing performance-based capitation and uh, prescribing iteration policy for chronic, and uh, we call it chronic refer back drug services so that they no need to go to the primary health care again, but can go directly to the pharmacist. And of course that now, next slide please. We are in trying to improve the quality of primary health care services. Our many innovation, for example, we are reducing the queue and linkage yeah, between information system management from primary care to the hospital. Previously, complaint from the members, they can wait up to five to six hours to get services. But now after we are developing innovations using Q system uh, online, this just, uh, you know, uh, reduce the queue uh, much time. Next slide, please. That is our uh, referral system also trying to improve. Next slide. So again, next slide, please. This is our conclusion that Chica and journey to achieve general cell coverage has been uh, proven. Of course, that is very dynamic and many challenges. And we are optimistic, actually, within a relatively short period of time, we would be able to implement. And of course, that many challenges are ahead. However, many improvements uh, we already made and we will made in the near future. And social security health system must endure the rapid dynamic of the world through developing robust mechanism to ensure affordable and high quality healthcare can be delivered to the people on a timely basis. And Indonesian government have created an important milestone toward that goal by inter-institution cooperation and coordination. And the challenge to improve JKN financial sustainability is not only to ensure more revenues are collected, 
than spend, but also to ensure effective, efficient JKN benefit package and also uh, effective uh, coverage. So effective coverage is very important. And then, of course, strong commitment from the government, from many stakeholders, and support from all stakeholders are needed for JKN quality health services. I think that is all, and thank you very much. And uh, for the discussion, I think uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. David Benmon, will, uh, you know, uh, respond it after the, you know, uh, time of discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mukti, for your wonderful insights on JKN scheme and Indonesian experience uh, in USC. It was enriching to hear about the experience of Indonesia, where not only the country took concrete steps, but also merged all the schemes into one which is a bold step which very few countries in the world have done so far. India indeed has a lot to learn from your experience, especially in targeting the missing women population. I would now request, uh, we have now been joined by, by Dr. Vinod uh, V.K. Paul. V.K. Paul, sir, uh, is a member of the IOC and has been a guiding light and uh, all the constant source of motivation uh, and has been a, uh, of immense uh, help to us at each stage uh, of implementation and formulation of this scheme. I will warmly welcome Dr. Paul, sir, and I would request sir to kindly uh, deliver uh, his uh, thoughts uh, before the audience. Thank you, sir. I think Dr. Paul sir has again got disconnected. I will now request, uh, while he joins back, Dr. Joseph Kuzin for his special address on this global experience on the USC. Over to you, Dr. Kuzin. Thanks very much. I'm just going to, sorry, one second, share my screen. Here we are. Very good. Are you able to see that as yet or no? Let me just try. Right. Here we go. Oh, I see. Sorry. Yes. Here we are. Good. Well, thanks very much. I'm really quite uh, humbled to be part of this distinguished panel and also to, to follow the excellent. Uh, presentation by Dr. Ali Gufran Mukti. I'm, I'm going to try to, in, in just a few minutes and in very uh, light touch, let's say, uh, convey some of the, the main messages from global experience on health financing for UHC and to try and relate those a bit uh, to what is happening you know, in the context of this third anniversary for PMJ. I would say it's 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 really um, you know a, a great opportunity to uh, sort of be back in India um, this time without any jet lag. So it's it's nice to have this uh, opportunity to give an overview of just key messages uh, that I'll go through. One is that expanding coverage through public finance can provide a strong foundation for universal health coverage but under certain conditions and in particular this the the approach of non-contributory based entitlement um, the idea of having a strong purchasing agency that's relying on a, a a sound information system that really covers the entire population and having uh the that purchasing agency having the autonomy balanced with accountability um, uh, for the goals that are defined overall for the sector. And I believe that PMJ reflects many of those uh, good practices, but of course, there's always room for improvement. And I'll say a bit more about each of these in, in the few minutes that I have. First is, is just the basic message. We've seen in our global data uh, a very clear relationship between a public expenditure on health, which is measured on the x-axis here, the horizontal axis as a percentage of GDP, 
and the dependence of systems on out-of-pocket payment, which of course creates a risk um, for uh, problems of financial protection or, and financial hardship arising uh, from health expenditures. And basically there's a, a strong inverse relationship. The more that governments are able to spend, the less people have to pay out of their own pocket. But we also observe that at any particular level of spending, uh, public spending, there's quite a lot of variation, which means that policies matter a lot as well. And you can see in the small print, India is over here towards the left, very low public spending on health, very high out of pocket spending as well. And this is a, a persistent uh, problem. The reforms, including PMJ, go some way towards addressing this. But as, as I think everyone knows, much of that expenditure is out of pocket medicines and um, the reforms don't really address that so much. So what we see in practice and in terms of lessons from other countries is that indeed it is general revenues that are driving practice, driving many country expen expen uh, coverage expansions in low and middle income countries. And this is largely because the context of high informality, as we heard about from Indonesia, really limits the scope for direct taxes, such as the contributions to uh, social health insurance. So the reforms have tended to often, not always, but often involve a non-contributory basis for entitlement, which means that entitlement really derives from something else. It may be being below the poverty line, it may be, being a resident of the country um, or not being covered by any other scheme, for example. So there's lots of ways of, of doing this. One of the problems and, and why um, among the many challenges of essentially reaching uh, people in the informal sector for coverage is illustrated from this example um, that I saw presented and I have the ability to use um, from several Latin American countries which conveyed the message that in fact formality and informality are not permanent conditions that at least in these countries and i don't know if it's the case in india people tended to move a lot or transit between formal job entry and loss of jobs and that, that's what these percentages uh, refer to here the percentage of some of of the population that might be changing its status from formal to informal so in such contexts, when that's happening, um, it's actually quite hard and, and challenging to track those changes and say, okay, now this person's in social security health insurance, now this person has lost their coverage. They found in some cases in studies from Mexico showing that this actually interrupted continuity of care in many cases. Perhaps more fundamentally with thinking about universal health coverage, it kind of explicitly says that coverage is not a right, but actually just an employee benefit. And if the idea that coverage is a right is something, then moving away from this contributory basis is important. So we know that there are attempts, and we saw this also in the Indonesian presentation, there are attempts to register the unorganized population. I think my message is simply to go into that with reasonable expectations. Um, because it is in general hard to collect any form of direct taxation uh, from this part of the population. And, and especially given these uh, implications of people moving in and out of formality. So we have many positive examples of using general revenues um, on a non-contributory basis. And those would be here, for example, people are probably quite familiar with the Thai universal health coverage scheme in which everybody who is not covered by one of the formal social security schemes is automatically enrolled and covered from, um, from general revenues. We also have arrangements where certain population groups are entitled to a broad range of services. So in Cambodia, we have this under what's called the health equity funds that reimburse uh, user fees on behalf of people below the poverty line or defined group. And of course, PMJ is very much in this category as well completely non-contributory entitlement funded from budget revenues for people below the poverty line. Okay. There's other alternatives such as uh, universal, you know, that everyone could be entitled to only a selected set of services. And we have this in the example of 
Chile, and maybe uh, Dr. Baeza would say something about that experience as well under their guaranteed health services program. But you could also think of this in terms of things like the services from a TB program or an HIV program, where you would never want to make those benefits contingent on a contribution. And then we have examples, and Indonesia was one, China is another, of in, in more contributory based systems using budget revenues to fully or partially subsidize the premium payments. Um, and it was also really um, gratifying to see in, in Dr. Gufan Mukti's presentation the data that was showing the reduction in inequalities and in service use that had happened uh, through the Indonesian reforms. Now, this idea of saying, you know, we should rely on general revenues is a nice idea, but we know countries are greatly fiscally constrained and they need to find other sources as well as try to make systems more efficient. The problem is that even though more is needed, um, basically non-government contribution, non-mandatory contribution mechanisms generally don't work very well. Uh, and this is due to the really deep market failures that limit basically voluntary prepayment arrangements. Um, it is possible to make it better. And I think regulation and a strong policy framework can help and is very much worth doing. But it, the, the evidence is clear that it's quite difficult. And the gains from this, especially in terms of revenue generation, will not be great. And so it's important to, to go into this with a clear view and, and reasonable expectations of what can be achieved. So where we think the focus really needs to be placed is actually looking at coverage expansion in a kind of dynamic framework. And that means building solid foundations for this. And, and perhaps most important here is the purchasing function, right? The, the, the ability to use the prepaid money you've got wisely in terms of driving your policy objectives around efficiency, quality, and equity. Because we know that simply throwing more money at the problem won't be of much help. Another important part of this is that while financing schemes often, as PMJ does, only cover a part of the population, to go into the design aspects of that uh, with an overall system or population-wide perspective is very important. This is what we call going from scheme to system. And I'll give an example of that in a moment. And then really as part of this foundation, it's what might be called helping working to change the culture of systems from kind of hierarchical bureaucratic inertia towards more dynamic data-driven approaches that are based on a, a very positive or virtuous cycle of implementation generating and analyzing data, and then learning and adapting. So I'm going to give one example, one that I know well, I've worked there some time ago, of, of how what it means to design universally, universality and early in the process. And this is uh, from a small country, which I guess all examples are small compared to India, possibly not, I guess, Indonesia. Um, but it was an idea where reform was starting and it wasn't possible both politically, especially politically at that point, to create a single pool of all the funds. But what they did early on in the reform process was to take a decision to unify all the data systems. So for example, in hospitals for every discharged patient, there was the same form used, creating a, a single unified database and the patient's insurance status or exemption status was just one of the fields on that form. So for the insured, it was used for payment, but managing the whole database was done from the beginning. And this occurred over four years. And with that data, they were able to simulate different policy options to enable scale up of coverage, what it would imply for the providers, how they needed to restructure and so on. And when that time came and more and more of the budget money was changed from just top down line item budgets into running it through this purchasing mechanism, the agency, the, the health insurance fund was able to adapt and the providers could be prepared for that change. So this idea of unifying the data or making the systems interoperable is a critical early step that can be taken uh, to support progress towards universal coverage. 
Now, there, we think there's great potential with PMJ, both to strengthen uh, the NHA as an institution and uh, to transform the policy priorities that you have into practice. Some specific ideas uh, for your consideration around uh, strengthening the purchasing function. One is to reconsider this long history in India of using the so-called package rates or package tariffs and transitioning to a more relative value formula-based payment system with explicit policy coefficients. What does that mean? It means that in, in, in most countries with well-developed payment systems, uh, they don't go through the process of negotiating entire prices. Uh, that's very politically difficult and it's hard to manage. Instead, you have something where you kind of have a, you have a budget estimate and you use that to calculate a base rate, which might be multiplied by the expected utilization, but then build in coefficients that might reflect the relative uh, cost of different procedures, for example. You can build in other coefficients, whether that's for teaching or for equity and so on, and as well as a, a coefficient to enable you to ensure budget neutrality. So all of these things are ways to operationalize different policy priorities through the payment systems. And we think that that's something that's possible to transition to in India. Another point in which we think is, is you're moving in that direction with the National Digital Health Mission is to leverage technology to move towards a more uh, interoperable patient database, using that to drive provider efficiencies. Um, around benefit package, really focusing on the process, including looking at the cost data, applying health technology assessment and budget impact analysis as a routine process for consideration of any proposed changes to that package. This, this purchasing arrangement can also inform your engagement with private providers, but certainly public providers as well, and emphasize really building the professional capacity of the staff to not just analyze the data, but also to ask the right questions of the data. One of those types of questions, this is one example from Hungary, which shows by county variation in antibiotic use. And I don't know, I'm an economist, I don't know what the right level is, but the variation does not seem to make a lot of sense. And so by starting to use your payment system data to get at information like this, you can start identifying where do we need to look? Um, where might we have a problem? Where might we have good practice that we want to learn from? And ultimately, again, to change the culture from focus on just compliance and fraud and more towards promoting your policy objectives. So in conclusion, just to say happy anniversary, um, we do think that PMG, the, the reform involving PMJ reflects many aspects of global good practice. For example, around non-contributory entitlement, general revenue funding, and having an institution with explicit responsibility for purchasing. But as with all countries, and as we heard with Indonesia, there's still some distance to travel as one part of the architecture. And thinking about comprehensive reforms, addressing primary healthcare, addressing medicines, and really to strengthen your capacities for strategic purchasing through more focus on the data analysis will be critical. So thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Cuisine, for raising some very pertinent points based on the global experiences and sharing global landscape of contributory and non-contributory uh, schemes uh, uh, prevalent across the globe. The importance of government expenditure uh, increase cannot be overemphasized, and India is committed to increase government spending on health. You're absolutely right that covering informal workers and taking contributions from them is very tricky. So we have much to learn on covering this population. So far, we've made good progress in covering poor and vulnerable, but now we need to move towards forward with covering higher levels of population. You gave excellent ideas for implementation and roadmap of PMJ towards universal healthcare. I would like to convey that uh, in, 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 on, on the aspects of leveraging technology, we are uh, in, in a big way thinking and implementing the convergence with the National Digital Health Mission and national uh, uh, you know, claims platform, health claims platform would uh, very soon be a part of PMJY. We are also working uh, uh, within national organizations to implement 
provider payment mechanisms like DRG. So uh, as you mentioned that we need to come to a formula based approach for claim processing and that is very much on the cards. We also are working on uh, the health benefit processing and we look, uh, in fact, uh, uh, most of the, I think that you are, you mentioned that quite pertinent and uh, I assure you that uh, we'll work more on them and whatever uh, feedback or inputs have come from you and are, are very valuable and we, we, we would definitely like to implement them in our uh, program. Thanks once uh, again and we look forward to more interactions with you uh, and, and in future and to uh, get opportunities to learn from you. Thank you very much. I would now request uh, Dr. Vinod Paul, sir, to kindly present his thoughts on UFC in India. Paul, sir. I think there's some... Uh, Dr. Dr. Agarwal, hi. Sir, sir. Can I come in later? I was uh, attending to a press briefing. No issue, sir. No issue, sir. So, sir yeah, so I can come in after uh, other two speakers. I'll get an opportunity to learn. So I'm here to stay and uh, if you don't mind. Thank, very you. Much, sir. Very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks a lot, sir. So now uh, I would like to, uh, uh, I would like to give it to uh, Professor Vini uh, to kindly present her thoughts. Uh, over to you, Dr. Joy. Okay. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to um, speak at the anniversary event. And it is my great honor um, to be with this group of audience with uh, ample experience in India and also global experience. Um, um, it, uh, let me know if you cannot hear me, um, otherwise I would um, start. Um, so I just want to, uh, before I present, I just want to say that uh, I feel very humble to be able to share some of the work that we have been doing in India. Um, the data that I'm presenting today is uh, collecting in Odisha, a poor state um, but some of the results I think that might be um, quite generalizable to the other parts of India. So um, I'm going to try to share with you some of the evidence that we have been able to collect and then um, provide a few takeaways on and implications for UHC in India. Next slide, please. So um, I just go, I'm going to focus on the uh, main findings. The first finding that we have is that financial risk protection, it is still quite poor. And the main driver for financial risk, low financial risk is actually out of pocket spending for outpatient care and also spending on drugs. As you can see on the slide from our survey, which is consistent with what is found in NSSO is that the share of household with catastrophic health expenditure share uh, measure at about 10% is uh, about 24%. And about 10% um, of the household are being impoverished by our pocket spending. And what is interesting on this uh, slide is that the share of catastrophic expenditure that is due to drug is actually 65% compared to the share of catastrophic expenditure that is due to hospital is only 22%. And this is probably um, not news. It is actually something that we find in other countries as well, but quite often ignored. So then the question is, where do people spend this money? And in our survey data, for people who go to our, um, outpatient care, about 54% of them go to private sector. And among the private sector, they, of the 54%, 24% each point only go to, uh, go to solo practice, private, but the other 30% actually go to private chemists. And they spend a lot of money. And if you look at the, the, the table, those who go to a private hospital for outpatient, 38% of them would have catastrophic expenditure. Go, those going to private chemists, 25%. But what is striking is that those who go to the public sector of which care is supposed to be free, there's still a quite high level of catastrophic expenditure. And among those people who go to public sector, actually 72% of them would afterwards still go to a private chemist. So if you take all of that together, the private sector play a very significant role in our, um, outpatient setting. A lot of money is spent on drugs and um, 
outpatient um, care is actually a major contributor to catastrophic expenditure. Next, please. So then we started to ask the question of why, why people want to purchase drugs from private chemists rather than going to the public sector. Well, the first reason, it could be supply problem. And when we compare supply stock in um, hospital versus primary care, there's no question that hospitals has much better supply. And then the primary care level, when we compare the public versus the private sector, there's no question that the private sector has much better supply of drugs. And even though it is not perfect. The second possible reason is that there's actually a financial incentive for the public sector provider to refer the patient to go to the private chemists. And in fact, our survey find that 15% of the patient said that they were specifically referred to, they were referred to some specific chemist store. And it is very likely that there is tied financial in incentive between the public providers and also what they can uh, uh, earn by referring people to these private chemists. Third is that um, providers in the public sector may purposefully or not purposefully prescribe drugs, in particular name brand drugs that people want, and but that are not available in the private in the public sector. And in fact, the most common reason cited by patients going to private chemists is better stock of drugs, variety of drugs, and also um, without surprise, the convenient hours. And if you look at the map, we actually map out how private cameras in India is located in relation to public facilities. In fact, most of them are located quite close to the public facilities. In other words, the two type of providers is actually interconnected. And But we want to ask the question, is it interconnected in the way that we want it to, or um, are there ways to improve it? Next slide, please. Well, the next question then that we raise is then, well, is people getting really good quality of care? Obviously, if people are spending a lot of money, our pocket spending is a major um, source of financing. So we conducted um, interviews using vignettes um, for a number of public and private primary care level providers. We asked them um, questions about five health conditions that are very common. And without going into details of these tables and diagrams, what um, would be useful to focus on is the percentage of incorrect diagnosis is just very high. It's as high as 58%. And if you cannot get the diagnosis correct, then it's very difficult to get the treatment correct. And among those that diagnose correctly, the percentage who actually have correct treatment is really, really low, it's in the single digit. And that's not just that, it's also providers tend to prescribe a lot of drugs. And the percentage of provider who actually prescribe correct drugs is quite low. It is um, in the order of about 50 to 70%. And there are also um, the percentage of provider who provide at least one unnecessary drug is really, really high. It varies from about 30% for asthma to as high as to almost 100% for tuberculosis. And these are important lessons. These are important lessons is because there's no question that there needs to be more financing, but it's money well spent. Next slide, please. Now, what I just presented is more outpatient. What about at the inpatient level? We haven't been able to do clinical review. Um, we were planning to do that then COVID hit. But we can present some data on um, hospital care using patient safety. Um, we survey um, medical college, district hospitals, subdivisional hospitals using an internationally recognized hospital survey for patient safety culture to find out adverse events and medical errors. And in the case of India, there's almost no patient safety events reported in any of the hospitals that we survey, which is not possible. And less than 10% of hospital staff reported ever submitting the safety report. And this is compared to the international standard of about 45%. 
And this is indirect evidence, but this is saying that quality is really quite at a low level with lots of room for improvement. We also measure patient satisfaction for inpatient care. Patient satisfaction by now is, um, there's evidence to show that it is actually correlated with clinical outcome as well. And again, the level of um, satisfaction is relatively low. And what is striking is that those who are in a lower social economic class is particularly disadvantaged. Next, please. Uh, next, please. So what about overall satisfaction? Um, borrowing again an internationally um, accepted survey instrument conducted by the Commonwealth Fund, um, looking at people's satisfaction with the healthcare system, we found that about 56% of the health system uh, expressed that the healthcare system needs major change. 33% expressed that the system needs complete rebuild and about 91% said it needs to be improved. And again, the, there is variation in the sense that low income, low education, and also um, tribal population tend to report lower satisfaction. Next, please. So what are some of the key findings and takeaways? Um, I have not presented to you data on utilization. There's no question that over the past 10 years or so, utilization actually has been going up. So quantity has been increasing and that's a great achievement. Um, although there's still inequality that is being observed. And what I am presenting today are probably more focusing on areas that can still be improved. One, financial risk protection, definitely there is still room for improvement. And we found that our pocket spending on outpatient care and drugs are actually major drivers. And a large share of our pocket service, of outpatient services, actually happen in the private sector with linked financial interests with the public sector, probably. Inappropriate care, excessive drug prescri prescription is quite prevalent in both public and private sector. And low quality of care is also a potential problem in hospital sector. So what is the implication for UHC? The current PMJY does not really cover outpatient services. And in addition to poor financial risk protection, International experience has also shown that it might cause delay in care and incentivize people to use hospital care for simple health problems. And in fact, that was the mistake that China made. So the question is how to cover that. And today we have many experts to help us to think about that together. And in fact, uh, I understand that the Indian government is also thinking seriously to expand PMJY to cover outpatient care. The second major takeaway is that the value of for, of for money is low or at least highly variable. So how to improve efficiency and quality of care is a very, very important next step to focus on. And the main lesson that I would want to leave is financing is necessary, but not sufficient to take any country to UHC. And I can speak for the country that I work most in, which is China. China quadrupled the government spending in health, covers 96% of its population. Quantity of services has increased by three times, four times, but quality and efficiency has not made much improvement. And it would create serious threat to financial sustainability and may not actually be very impactful on financial risk protection or improvement in health outcomes. So service delivery also needs to be improved simultaneously. And this is a question that we have been discussing very often for many years around the world. Shall we 
in, shall we reform financing first or shall we reform delivery system first? And my takeaway is that it probably need to be done together because improving efficiency and quality usually meets a resistance from the provider. And it becomes much easier if you do it together when there is new money. The next slide, please. So then what are some of the things that can be done to improve value for money? And I just want to echo the previous two presenters that NHS is in a very, very important position to do that because you are the stretch a purchaser and therefore you can leverage your financial power in order to make changes in the delivery system. And if you do in, in expand to outpatient care, do selectively contract private providers because you have enough choices. And of course, there is a hard question to think about, that is how do you include informal providers? Changing payment method, it is important. Changing payment method that would somehow tie the payment to some measure of quality, starting small, is very important. And I would say that the world is really moving towards integrated delivery system. And DLG is a very commonly used payment method for the hospitals, um, capitation used for primary care. But India probably has a good opportunity to leapfrog by doing something innovative. You can try paying capitation to a network of hospital and outpatient clinic. And actually, in this case, make the hospital accountable for improving outpatient care and primary care in the outpatient clinic because the incentive is tied together. Um, no need to say establish essential drug list is important. And Joe has already said that leveraging the national digital health mission is also important and good opportunity. But I would just caution to say that very often technology and data alone doesn't need to change. It needs to be combined with governance and incentive system change as well. Um, we talk a lot about the private sector today, but I would also urge you to also think about how to reform the public sector, especially the hospital sector. And that will require NHA working with the Ministry of Health. And in many countries, we have found that that is increasingly difficult. But again, I hope that India can again leapfrog and demonstrate to the world how to do that. Thank you very much. Um, and I look forward to learning from the rest of the um, speakers and um, sharing other uh, lessons. Thank you, Dr. Reeb, uh, for your very interesting. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Prabhati, uh, for uh, your very interesting presentation. And uh, as you rightly said, findings from one state have many learnings for the whole country. Efficiency and quality, indeed, are very important aspects to reach to the universal health coverage. You're absolutely right that catastrophic spending on drugs is critical. And now India is working on providing comprehensive primary care to health, to health and wellness centers. And we're also working to establish forward and backward linkages with the primary arm of Ayushman, that is the health and wellness centers, to ensure, as you mentioned, that inappropriate treatment uh, in, in uh, secondary care, despite uh, the patient requiring only primary care, all those issues, I think, will get addressed in due course. Changing the perception and attitude uh, uh, is definitely a, is a greater challenge. Issue of quality is extremely important. We need to create a seamless linkage. And also uh, uh, your ideas on uh, DRG leveraging NDHM, strengthening the legal framework and incentivizing quality are extremely valuable. And um, uh, we are working on quite a lot of them uh, to ensure these issues are addressed and India ultimately reaches to the objective of universal healthcare. Thanks very much uh, once again, um, Professor, for joining. Thank you. I will now request Dr. Christian Baiza to deliver his speech. Dr. Baiza. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me today. I would like to thank the organizers, uh, the Director General of NHA, Dr. Awarwal, Dr. Paul Nishant, and many others. And let me congratulate NHA and the people of India for the third anniversary of PMJ, which I think is one of the most innovative and promising schemes in expanding health coverage for those who need the most through private public collaboration. That is a really inspiring scheme. It is a great pleasure and a privilege to be able to join my distinguished colleagues in this panel. So um, without further ado, let me just 
present, please uh, confirm that you see the presentation, please. It would be helpful. Perfect. Yes, that's okay. That's okay. So, um, thank you so much. So, um, I was invited to reflect on potential learnings from India from a global UHC experience. And although India is really unique, and it is really unique, <laughs> nothing compares to India, uh, I believe there are many important potential learnings um, that uh, can apply and may be useful to apply. It's impossible to uh, you know, be able to touch uh, based on all of them in 10 minutes, it will be a scene. So I, I chose four, and then you will see that I will discuss only uh, one in particular. So the four learnings for me, potential learnings are, uh, first, I think at the end, for those of us who are, for those countries like us, ours, that are at the beginning of this journey or close to the beginning of this journey, uh, we need a multi prong approach uh, for UAC. And I mean by that, a, a, a all of the above plurality of approaches in the early days. Uh, I think the second big lesson is that successful path to UHD is first and foremost a country overall political effort, the whole country effort, uh, led by decisive leadership from the top. I think if you look at the experience around the world, particularly in emerging markets that are successful in that path, uh, that is a big, big lesson. Success requires a value-based vision from the top country leadership, which is followed by sound technical design to implement it and not the other way around. We technocrats, and I there to include myself in that, sometimes believe it's the other way around. We know and, and political leaders should follow us. I think it's the other way around. It's a political decision. The, sec the third, I think, big lesson is that what matters is effective access and protection. We can use the multiple instruments we have at hand, but um, uh, universal enrollment is a necessary condition, but far from being a sufficient condition. That people are all covered by a scheme or two or three or four is good, but what really matters is whether this is actually providing access and protection. And finally, I think the fourth for me is that it is critical to evaluate uh, impact of all approaches being used, not because it's an academic luxury, uh, which you know I think is we, we people working in the academic world, we wanna do that, but because it's essential for social accountability and political and population support. There are a number of examples around around the world that shows that good evaluations showing real impact of the promises we make actually sustain the schemes in the longer term. I think one of them, when I know very well, is Plan Nacer in uh, Argentina. So um, as I said before, due to time uh, constraints, I will focus on, on one, which is I think probably the most important and potentially the most controversial in this conversation, which is I do believe that for us at the beginning of our journeys, a multi-pronged approach in USC is critical. And let me um, just uh, go quickly through what I mean by that. So uh, if you look at the path of USC to OECD countries, uh, it has been historically not a single model path, but a multi-pronged ap uh, approach and effort. Although many of us tend to forget it because it has passed you know, decades, if not a century, since they began this, and we tend to see the final model. I think the second part of that is that what really matters is not what is the final model that we aspire to the sort of paradise island, but it is, uh, and we all have a preferred one. I do have, and I share Dr. Kutzin uh, view that a, a fully funded, publicly funded model is a preferred one for the long term uh, in the paradise island kind of vision. The challenge is the transition and how do we make sure that rather than the model discussion, we have a consistency of policies and design in the use of the different models we are using and the different approaches we are using in the transition. Um, it is not sufficient to prove that these models are uh, being beneficial to the, to the participants. It is also imp important to prove that they will not hamper the non-participants uh, uh, in, in, in their uh, benefits, particularly if these non-participants are the poor. And I would say that um, um, although I am, I believe strongly in a multi-pronged approach, because that is the route that we've seen in the last century for OECD countries, by the way, before they arrive where they are, uh, is, is certainly a, a challenge in terms of the, uh, how prone they are to fragmentation 
And therefore, taping on these multiple tools and instruments in UHC needs also to include efforts to harmonize and functionally integrate them so we really arrive where we want to arrive and not to a, a, a even more dysfunctional uh, uh, goal. So let me let me use a, a graph, a simple graph to you know ex, uh, show what I mean by that. So if you look at the early days in in OECD countries uh, around the world, the ones that are arriving or have arrived, and not all of them have arrived. I live in one that has not, the United States. If you look at the early days and using a financing lens, and I agree with uh, Professor Jib that using financing is not the only dimension of this discussion. Uh, uh, you can see that uh, they are in, in the early days, there is a huge fragmentation. There is very low level of risk pooling or insurance and uh, out of pocket really are the prominent source of financing uh, for actually three populations, the formal non-poor, the informal non-poor and the poor. And I, I, I highlight those three populations because in the transition, as you will see in most countries around the world that have you know really transitioned or have transitioned to uac they tackle the problem uh, consistently but separately very often so in a long journey in some cases in a journey of almost a century i would i would argue many most countries of the oecd have end up in a model where there is uh, integration there is an, an integrated system, being it pluralistic or being it a single payer, where there is a very significant reduction of out of pocket uh, and a very significant increase in um, in uh, risk pooling, in in participation in risk pooling. In some cases, I would argue the lowering of out of pocket is so much that it might become un, uh, unsustainable and pro potentially. Um, uh, inefficient from a risk pooling perspective. So there is a, a, such a thing as too much is too much. Too much. Um, and um, I would uh, argue also that most countries end up also, as Dr. Kutzin referred to, uh, preferring a very significant share of public financing in this end stage, which is also my preference. The challenge is not what is your preference of the final island to arrive, the challenge is how you do in the middle when you don't have the means to uh, to go directly and leapfrog to the Paradise Island. So um, the, the countries, the OECD countries, I would say, have done this long journey through um, a two pronged approach. One is in one that increase uh, the target public financing in expanding fully subsidized risk pooling for the poor. Uh, which is exactly what I think India is embarked, and I'll refer to that in a moment. And second, by a, an expansion of contributory risk pooling for the non-poor in a combination of tax-based uh, contributions, which we often in global health refer as non-contributory, but it is contributory, except that it's used uh, through general taxation and re general revenue, or uh, through social insurance, or even through privately run, privately run insurance models and instruments. Uh, most of them have uh, ended in different models. It's not that we have one model, everybody in transition and had one. I think we de when you see the, the Germans and you see the Dutch and you see the English and, and others, you, you really uh, realize that these are different models that have achieved universal coverage. However, none of them chose a model at the beginning of this journey. In other words, most of them chose the ho their horse at the end of the race, after the race and not before it. Now, but this has been such a long time that we tend in global health to forget the origin, origins uh, of this uh, transition and often advocate to emerging markets and country closer to the early days to choose a model, to choose a horse before the race. So one, when, when one looks at this transition and history, in my view, this is for me the, one of the main lessons. We in emerging markets need to use all means at hand to advance UAC and also use uh, and also choose our horse close to the end rather than at close to the beginning. And yes, of course, there are technical lessons on specific financial arrangements, regulations provide a payment uh, that uh, Dr. Jib was very extensive about that, that will make our life easier not to repeat some of the technical errors. But when it comes to the final model, 
as OECD did, although we forget it, I think it, it is wise to use all tools at hand and advance UEC in all fronts and use the horse at the end of the race rather than the beginning. <clears throat> I think, uh, I believe that India is wisely pursuing one of the pillars of this, which is the expansion of risk pooling by replacing OOPS with public financing through uh, a PMJ and other programs. As, as uh, Dr. Kutzin said, there is always in every uh, man and women work uh, things to be perfected. But I do believe that this is a very promising, very innovative uh, and incredible scope um, uh, effort to to move from uh, non-pooling to more pooling, non-contributory uh, risk pooling for the for the poor. Now, if you judge based on, and this is my last slide, if you judge based on the OECD experience also, I do believe that uh, um, to ensure the right path when you use multiple tools as uh, um, exist also in India, um, you will need to look at uh, the effectiveness and the consistency of contributory risk pooling, including uh, tax-based risk pooling, um, especially for the middle and uh, middle missing uh, or missing middle, and for the informal and poor. Uh, I think that it, it means, in my very limited uh, knowledge of India, that revisiting and looking at the social insurance such as ESI and CGHI, commercial insurance, state schemes, and uh, on the overall system consistency and incentives in how they're working together to expand UHC and ensure integration and good performance is critical for the next steps in India, again, with my very limited knowledge of India. So let me stop here because I, I am far beyond my 10 minutes, but let me thank again the organizers for this wonderful opportunity to join you in this dialogue again, and a huge congratulations to everybody for the anniversary of PMJ and many more. We in the world are looking very closely at this experience. I look forward to the questions and answer session. Thank you so much. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Dr. Baiza, uh, for raising uh, these uh, very, very important four points, and especially focus, focusing on the multi-pronged approach, which many of us tend to forget. In a country like India, targeting without much error is a huge challenge, as there may be inclusions and exclusion errors. As you suggested, we also hope to find a solution for covering non-poor with contributions when they are in the informal sector, as the government paying for everybody is difficult. In fact, NHA is working on models for covering the missing middle, and uh, we are uh, hopeful that we'll come out with some good solution at the end of the exercise. Thanks very much once again. We hope to learn more and discuss more uh, in future with you. Thank you very much. Finally, I would like to invite Dr. Atul Kotwal for making a presentation on the steps being taken to achieve universal health coverage in India and the way forward. Over to you, Dr. Kotwa. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, all the dignitaries, and uh, good afternoon to respected uh, Vinod Paul, sir. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll quickly share with you all the role the National Health Mission is playing in India's journey towards universal health coverage. Next, please. The, the key objective of National Health Mission are to support states and the UTs towards the provision of universal access to equitable, affordable, and quality healthcare services, which are accountable and responsive to people's needs with effective intersectoral coordination, addressing the wider social determinants of health. In fact, a brief uh, what happened before this, prior to this, in 2005, that was a game changing moment when the National Rural Health Mission was launched. And first time in the country, uh, the, the policy was clear about, you know, the intersectoral coordination, uh, human resources for health, health system strengthening, communitization, and uh, flexible uh, financing. So these kind of issues were, uh, I think, were not there in the planning earlier uh, to that, with, with that focus. Event, by 2014, we, had, we launched the National Health Mission, which subsumed the rural as well as urban health mission, and we started working towards the universal health coverage. We have the three main focus areas, if you can see down, down below, to provide technical and financial support to states to strengthen the health systems, to bring sharper focus on high focus states and rural populations, particularly the marginalized and vulnerable populations. And also, when we talk of health systems, the architectural corrections through integration of vertical program, decentralization, and also communitization. Next, please. There have been tremendous gains. 
and these gains are if you see the lines if you see these gains are much more from 2005 onwards and especially from 2013 14 onwards there has been a tremendous drop in the maternal mortality ratio and we we have about 80% from 1990 onwards has come to 45% for the global of course there are inter state variations and we we, we are all trying to address that next please same as story for under five mortality too, 71 percent decline with the world's 59 percent decline. Next, please. Total fertility rate is also now 2.2, and 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 the sharper decline if you see after 2005 onwards. Next, please. These these are the these are the important you know the uh, basis of what I or the previous three slides. This is improved antenatal care, increasing number of institutional deliveries. And tremendous increase number of postnatal care services uh, being utilized by the, uh, by the by the people in rural as well as urban areas. And this is on to, I'm talking only of public health facilities. There has been an increase in all these three in rural as well as urban between 2014 and 17, 18. I'm just covering the area at the time of National Health Mission and, and, and the focus since last seven odd years, which has been given to the entire National Health Mission. Next, please. This is also coupled overall with the increased public health care utilization. If you, if you compare from 2014 to 17, the OPD care in rural areas, urban areas, and also the IPD care in rural as well as urban areas, 16%, 24%, 10%, 9%, which is tremendous if you look at only the from 14 to 17, 18. The, these are the reasons if you see the blocks lower, lower down, there's a free drug service initiative. The panelists were mentioning that, you know, coupling the PMJ with, 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 with something, you know, free drugs and uh, diagnostics. So now, now if, if you the free diagnostic initiative, we have, uh, we have, we have uh, 14 tests at sub health center level, and we have 63 tests now at the, at the primary healthcare center level. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, close to hundred tests at community health center and almost 200 tests at the district hospital level. So there's a tremendous increase in, in diagnostics and drugs as for the ED and list are also available. The number of facilities are being increased gradually, specialists, the human resource for health, the, the increase in the number of specialists, doctors, other HR, including ANMs and ASHAs, and also nurses. Referral transport services, we have more than 20, 27,000 uh, ambulances which are available, plus there are other kind of referral transport services also which are there. And of course, national health program, and, and there is a kind of, uh, you know, coordination amongst all these national health programs. Next, please. This slide also shows the same benefits that in public health facilities, there is a drop in average medical expenditure, whether uh, we private health care facilities. There's a tremendous increase in the out of pocket expenditure that private health facilities are concerned. Next, please. Out of pocket expenditure has shown a, a, a tremendous decrease if you see from 2004 5, 15%. And the latest national health accounts, which are yet to be released by the country, it has shown a further significant drop. And, and this all I have already mentioned earlier, free drugs, diagnostic, referral transport, support for infrastructure. Now we also have urban, urban health and wellness centers under the 15th Finance Commission. So the infrastructure, the building at sub-centers and PHCs funding is, is, is there for that. Conversion of the existing PHCs and sub-centers into the health and wellness centers, if the funds are available for that too. Next please. Human resources I have already mentioned, just to give the numbers, and how, how, how much of increase has taken place since the time of National Health Mission. Next, please. Ayushman Bharat Yojana in 2018. So the, the government of India did not look at only the PMJ, the financial protection for the secondary and tertiary care. It also looked at comprehensive primary health care and also some type of a, a, a large amount of secondary care also, which could be given at district hospital level. So, so this is these two are complementing each other with the ultimate aim of achieving universal health coverage and our primary health care the, the the goal is to have the comprehensive primary health care closer to communities with the principle of time to care to, to not to be more than 30 minutes and preventive and promotive health care to be part in fact the concept of the wellness we have wellness rooms in each each of these health and wellness centers where yoga and other activities are also taken place including counseling services which are there next please the transformation there now we have more than 12, 12 service packages so earlier focus was on rmn cha and n reproductive maternal neonatal child and uh, new and adolescent health and, and some nutrition components now we have expanded this list i'll share with you the other all the other components drugs diagnostic i have already mentioned 
the expanded human resource for health we have a community health officer in the leadership role at the sub center level which was earlier manned only by the multi purpose workers now we have the leadership in the form of community health officer uh, ably uh, uh, working along with the multi purpose workers and also asha which are the link between the healthcare facilities and the, and, and, and the society and, and we also have intersectoral coordination like eat right Mo movement and instead of rogi kalyan samiti at the health and wellness center we have jan arogya samiti we are going towards the concept of wellness as i mentioned earlier and technology of course linkage with pmj and leveraging technology i'll be sharing with you in the, in the next few slides next week this is the entire list if, if you if you see we have also added the uh, all the you know uh, screening prevention control of non communicable diseases we have we, the crores have been screened in last uh, two years for hypertension diabetes and, and also for three common cancers oral breast and cervical and we have um, ophthalmic eye and ent basic oral care elderly and palliative health care services emergency medical services and also men mental and neurological ailments so all these packages are being rolled out the the trainings are being done and and, and many states are in different phases of implementation of this next week so at every health and wellness center there is a database creation there is a population enumeration is done we have a cbac form which is used and 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 as per def defined criteria the screening is Uh, automatically done while filling up the cbac form those at high risk are immediately screened and those at lower risk are, are, are followed up health record cards and family health folders of course we are leveraging technology here too with the apps and all this data is uh, entered directly so that reports are generated in real time next week use of technology telehealth and reference teleconsulting services and uh, since last year it has become legal from 2020 So that, that 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 issue is also not there, and hub and spoke models also being used, and now now tremendous amount of funds are also already being given in our COVID response package, and and also now in the 15 Finance Commission, where where funding is being given to states to create the te te tele consultation hubs and even centers of excellence with a you know, hub and spoke model. Next, please. Next. So uh, so here when we talk of uh, linkages. it's not only the upward upward referral it's also closing the loop of the complete referral chain where once a patient is referred from to the higher facilities and then probably to the uh, uh, pmj and panel facilities there, there is a system there 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 there, 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 there is a resident desk and people working at the district hospital level which will close this referral chain loop so that all those who are coming back from the hospital are followed up till they reach the community and also there the CHOs and all will will then follow up, or if then the PHC area, MO PHC will follow up and so ensure that drugs are also available. Next please. Intersectional coordination to address social determinants of health is an integral part of com comprehensive primary health care. The Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, and we are also linking this with the uh, Swachh Swasth Sarvatr. With the ODF villages, we are giving more funds to those those community health centers. Is a balanced healthy diet and regular exercise, eat right movement. addressing tobacco alcohol substance abuse in the health and wellness center there are designated rooms and places for counseling and also follow up yatri suraksha that is preventing death due to rail and road traffic accidents preventive efforts as well as curative uh, nirbhay nari action against gender violence to reduce stress and improve safety in the workplace and also uh, reducing indoor and outdoor air pollution we uh, i would like to mention here so uh, the panelists are talking about quality we we, we are addressing quality uh, very very comprehensively it is uh, not only the uh, standard treatment guidelines the training for that the the uh, software are being made the sites are being, are being developed where the mos and even the other functionaries can get training regular training in, in addition to the capacity building which is being done regularly the quality is linked with the uh, certification process of quality which is linked with the awards and that has been taken up by all the states in a very very healthy competitive manner so we have national quality assurance standards for the government health facilities which are um, which which are, uh, um, uh, are accredited by the isqa which is international society of quality assurance and health we also have kaya kalp awards which look at the patient safety and uh, hygiene hygiene we also have specific uh, criteria for the lux which is called as lux and muskan lux is for the maternal care and muskan for the uh, for, for the for the for the child newborn and newborn and we have recently launched uh, launched suman that is the surakshit matra abhiyan so we are looking at the quality of care at each and every level next please 
and these are the few desired outcomes of course all the uh, all, all the speakers and all the dignitaries are, are aware of this we are we are targeting improved population coverage reducing out of pocket expenditure and, and catastrophic health expenditure risk factor mitigation through health promotion so we, we, we so we are trying to not only ensure that the people who need sick primary care they, they should not go to secondary care people should be leading needing less of the curative care it's more of preventive and promotive care and decongesting uh, secondary and tertiary care and of course with the ultimate aim of uh, the, the immediate aim, the immediate uh, goals are of course to achieve the targets of nhp and uh, sdgs the ultimate aim of achieving universal health coverage thank you very much uh, well uh, thank you very much professor gotwal uh, you are absolutely right uh, uh, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kotwal. You are absolutely right that National Health Mission has been a game changer in Indian healthcare system, and National Health System Resource Center has been a big contributor to the success of NHM. NHM has strengthened public health facilities in the last decade that has helped schemes like PMJY use the public hospitals to deliver care under the scheme. I'm sure that we can converge better between PMJ and NHM in the days to come at much deeper level so that we can improve the ultimate effectiveness of the government programs. Creating continuum of care by linkaging health and wellness centers and PMJY is something we are very excited about, and I'm sure that this would provide comprehensive health care to our beneficiaries. I would also like to sincerely thank all the panelists once again for their excellent insightful speeches. I'm sure it is a great learning from all your experiences, and it inspires us to develop roadmap for India's effort at universal health coverage. We now move on to the second part of this session, that is the question and answer session. A sincere apologies for the delay in start of this session as many of the panelists have some other engagements. I would now like to introduce Dr. Nishan Jain, who is the Program Director of German Development Corporation, GIZ, who is, uh, which is an international thought leader, and he is an international thought leader in the field of health economics, health financing, and health insurance. He's advising the governments in various countries in South and Southern Asia, Middle East, and Africa on the design and implementation of universal health coverage program. He's also a senior advisor to NHA, and is always available in all the policy uh, guidelines that we implement. I request now Dr. Nishan Jain to moderate this question and answer session. Over to you, Dr. Nishan Jain. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vipul. And uh, thanks to all the panelists for excellent sessions, you know, and uh, I wish we could have had more time to actually hear to all the others. Uh, but I will not take much time for pleasantries because we already had. Since we are already late, I apologize. We'll try to have quick question answer. And since Vinny had a prior engagement first, so maybe Vinny, I'll come to you first. You know, you have always been a very great well-wisher of India and the reforms here. And the questions which you raised in your presentation are very apt. Of course, there are no ready-made solutions to that uh, or ready-made answer, but you know, it makes us think. And, and I wanted to ask that, you know, you raised this issue about, for example, major out-of-pocket on, on medicine, for example, you know, and things like that. And on the one hand, we are trying to do this health and wellness center, which was presented by Dr. Kotwal right now. How do you see if we can link them? You know, we are trying, we have some thoughts on our own, but being an independent observer and seeing Odisha, for example, very closely, how do you see and what things we should be careful when we try to link these health and wellness center and schemes like PMJ? Thank you, Vinny. Oh, thank you so much. Um, first of all, I just want to um, congratulate India on the major, major progress that has been made in such a short period of time, but there are challenges ahead. Um, so I think one of the major challenge that from our study, but also is clear, is that um, Health and Wellness Centre definitely is a very important pillar um, in the Indian healthcare system, but there's also a huge private sector out there. And so the question is, so I think there are two set of questions. One set of question is how do you bring in the private sector? Because they already exist and people already go there. And we also always know that it is always easier to improve quality and efficiency starting from the place that people already are going there. So that's one linkage between health and wellness center and private. The other linkage is I would say is between health and wellness center and PMJAY, which is the tertiary care that is being that is being provided. Um, I think on the second question of linking the health and wellness center and the secondary and tertiary care, I think that many countries have tried to link it, 
but I would say that um, um, some simple ways to do it is just through um, administrative um, uh, um, re uh, uh, means, which would say um, get the two level to work with each other by standardizing um, information system, um, by making it a duty for the district um, hospital to train people at the health wellness center. But I would say to you that those are easy to introduce, but very hard to implement and usually doesn't result in much result, uh, effect. Unfortunately, those that really work still would have to get the secondary tertiary care level and the health and wellness center to be somehow tied in some joint financial interest. Because until then, it is very hard for them to put each other's interests in their own head. And that's why earlier I have mentioned that, especially if India is already thinking about covering um, health and wellness center in terms of extending benefit package, it is really an excellent opportunity to try to change to a payment method that combine secondary or tertiary care and health and wellness center care. Let the district hospital hold the budget, let them be the one be coordinating care, but what NHK can do is hold them accountable for not just their services, but the service in the health and wellness center as well. This is something that we're trying in, um, in, in China, in fact, because it's very hard to get the health and wellness center to be holding the budget. I mean, they are small, they don't have many managerial skills. And so it's okay to give the budget to a higher level, but you have to hold them accountable for services that is down. I think that on the health and wellness center and the private sector part is equally challenging. Um, um, again, when if and when PMBAY expand its coverage, service coverage to outpatient care, it will be important to indeed purchase from the private sector as well. And you have so much financial power, you really can select the good ones. That's your strength. And now I also have seen in India something which I think is very innovative and worth considering. It's actually very hard for NHA, SHA to really try to monitor and deal with a large number of private sector, right? I mean, there's limited capacity. And I have seen platforms called aggregator platform. That is, you use a private company or publicly run platform that bring on to these platforms the good individual private provider. And they have an incentive to get into your platform. I always compare it to Amazon or Uber, right? <laughs> they have an incentive to get onto your platform because they guarantee business. But in exchange, they have to follow certain standards. And I think that's the beauty about being a purchaser is because you can always leverage using financing. If you want my service, here is the deal. Um, so here are just some of them. Thank you, Vinny. And I think very pertinent point and very interesting comparison with Uber, for example. Uh, so thanks a lot, Vinny. Thanks for participation. And please, you're most welcome to stay. But if you have another engagement, as you said, you can go whenever you are free. Uh, also, now I want to come to David because Gufran is not here, but he has left us in the able hands of David, I guess. And you know, when you talked about financing, Vinny, uh, so Indonesia is a great example where we saw how things started happening very quickly in the last few years, last six to eight years, where with these big reforms. <coughs> and uh, two things I think for India is very interesting uh, from Indonesia's experience. One is that what you did to try to cover this informal middle class population, which can pay the contribution. How is your experience there? Because I think that's a big challenge in India we are seeing right now, which was mentioned earlier by Christian in some in, in some way in his presentation. Uh, and the other thing I think is that we are very curious, how did you got the civil servants to agree to come to the same scheme where everybody else is there? You know, it, it's not, it doesn't happen very easily in many countries across the world. Thailand is a good example, for example. Uh, so, so David, on, on the convergence or merger of these three schemes, what kind of challenges you faced and how did you try to find some solution? And also on the 
contributory part from the informal workers. Thank you, David, please. Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, I think basically our um, uh, GKN yeah, uh, health service, the basic uh, why we can uh, grow so much is because uh, the coverage that uh, the commitment from government. So we now achieve uh, eighty five percent of coverage. Uh, out of that eighty five percent, fifty percent is uh members who fully subsidized by government so 40 percent is from a central government and a 10 percent from a local government so they, they, this number is quite huge 135 million people covered by uh, government of course there are also exclusion error and inclusion error on that but uh, that really helped the 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 basic uh, uh, the basic of the uh, coverage, and twenty five percent is from uh, formal sector, twenty five percent, and from uh, informal sector uh, only ten percent. So uh, we start on two thousand fourteen. On two thousand fourteen, previously all civil servant already have an insurance. Uh, at the time, so it's quite easy, basically, because uh, the, the 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 concept from the transition from civil servant going to the national health uh, services is basically almost the the same scheme. So the out of that twenty five percent, fifty percent is uh, from civil servant, and twenty uh, another fifteen uh, percent is from private sector. So the challenge is, of, of course, on the informal sectors. So uh, we are talking with government how to increase the, uh, the subsidized. So right now, only fully subsidized uh, membership. We are talking uh, next step is the uh, partially subsidized. So in, uh, basically, we, we think that the inclusion arrow is not really problem because there's a natural selection so in in our health system there are three level of services so this this level basically related to inpatient room do, during the inpatient so basically if we uh, facing the inclusion error most people don't like to use the service because all subsidized members they get the third level so, so i think that's one of the key success that uh, the, our government really commit to subsidize uh, 50 percent of people with the risk of inclusion error but basically this inclusion error uh, doesn't bring any uh, negative impact because uh, the inclusion people uh, the, the 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 not poor people that that get the subsidized basically they will not not use the services so the the money is just from government to government there's no uh, wasting money so i think that's one of the uh, key thank you thank you david uh, you 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 try to answer it as much as you can but and uh, and of course we have many more questions but we will find another opportunity for that uh, now i'll come to joe uh, so so joe you know this you you raise some very interesting thoughts for us and and the whole idea of unifying the data before we can try to unify the scheme is something which is uh, which is very interesting for us because that is something which is step which is potentially non threatening to anybody and and it can be done and and, and you know I have, I have known you to be always a little bit provocative so if you if you want to be a bit provocative and suggest to india what two three steps we can take in next few years as a independent person who has worked both at global and at the national level so you know what is practical also not only from theory what steps will you suggest us as the next few in in the in the next few years to take thank you joe please thanks it's it's uh it's not an easy question just to say up front also that that uh my knowledge of, of the specifics of India is not very deep. 
um, because most of my my time in the country has to do has been to do what we're doing today in terms of of being at events like this, but I haven't been involved in, in the details. So maybe I would just look at this maybe from some experience elsewhere and then see what some of the, the challenges are. I mean, as always, and something that Dr. Baeza said as well, there's the, the need first for the political direction on this. So one country that we've been working with in, in West Africa, Ghana, which has done a fairly well in terms of moving its um you know expanding its insurance coverage has done okay on provider payment but still has huge gaps um and we have not been able in that case to resolve the political obstacles to what seems like a very technical recommendation about unifying the information platform so they still are faced with a lot of inefficiencies when you go to a hospital there you'll find one department entering the claims data and another department entering almost the same information for non-insured patients or actually for all patients. So I think one of the challenges and, and maybe critical step is to try to build some political consensus around the objective, right? That basically there is value to having, and, and you know, I'm, I'm a little hesitant, especially in the concept context of India to talk about one unified system given the magnitude of that but at least interoperable in the sense that basically or perhaps unified at state level one can see that to address particular problems right and and challenges so one is about just looking at um service utilization patterns say between insured and uninsured people do we see very different types of things Another, frankly, and I think this has been one of the experiences in, in, with the experience of COVID, has been um, to think through the linkages between the, in, the, the data for individual services and the public health surveillance system, right? So setting that as an objective, that in order to be able to respond well, we need, we need those interactions to be quite smooth. We don't want to have to be scrambling around to generate lots of new data when a crisis breaks out. So we need to understand service use patterns and we need to have these, what will be inevitably large individual records databases. So making, I think an important thing is to, to not just do it because somebody says, or to do it even from the perspective of health financing, but as an instrument for governance in the system. I mean, a lot of the examples and, and even, I mean, going back to something that uh, Professor Yip said as well, which is this idea of looking at more and more bundled payment systems. It's clear that you don't want to, you know, the ability to use provider payment incentives to drive, especially quality gains, is limited. But the ability to actually use the data from those provider payment systems can really inform such strategies and implementation and to look for things like practice variation, as I said, to identify outliers. Another might be to think about because of the particular challenge in India, is it possible to also create a prescribing database to start to, to analyze these things? So I think in a sense, for me, the critical issue is to try and build both political and then at the level of, of kind of the technicians, technical consensus around the problems that we can address if we have this. So in a sense, without kind of saying we have to use this particular data standard or, or that one. I, I think that idea of, of kind of focusing on how the potential uses of this will be of great help. And the last on this, which is at the same time, needing to give assurance about safeguards, because I think one thing we've all learned um, in many aspects of our lives in recent years are the risks of losing control of the data or, or, or that sort of thing. So ensuring, and I assume this is a major, I don't know the details, but I imagine it's a major, major part of, a, of the digital health mission is ensuring confidentiality and security of these databases. So both the individuals and providers can feel confident that it's going to be used uh, for the right purpose. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Joe. And I think uh, you, you, you put, down, put it down very nicely. Even in spite of the challenges of uh, not knowing India so deeply, you said, but but I think you know pretty well enough. Uh, so now I'll, I'll shift to Christian. 
Uh, Christian, you know, uh, you are always uh, have been a great friend and, and, and a great wish wish to India. And whenever you were here, and even when now you talked, you talked a lot about how do we try to converge these things together where we have a scheme like PMJ, which is for the poor. We have a scheme like employee state insurance, which is for the formal sector workers. Uh, and, and you have worked with both to some extent. So when you suggest some kind of convergence, do you see this happening in few steps or do you see it happening like in few phases? And how do you think or you can suggest this can be done? Because that itself can be a very big step for India. Christian, please, thank you. Thank you very much. My, my apologies, my connection is, is really challenging. Uh, so I hope you hear me well. Um, I think that is a very crucial question uh, for PMJ, and it has been the question for most countries, isn't it? You begin with this multi pron approach, you have multiple instruments. How do you make sure that at the end they integrate? So uh, I will talk about three things. One, first, I would not underestimate the power of PMJ, although it's not gigantic. I mean, a gigantic for for the world, but is it compared to the size of India is not gigantic. The power of uh, the power of, of PMJ is enormous and the potential. So if you look at the effects of Medicare and Medicaid in the United States, their purchasing practices and all the innovations and reforms and how that really tracked the whole path for the US uh, integration and changes in provider payments and all and so forth. I think that is one part. Uh, and I would not underestimate, and I think the burden of NHA to do it right is crucial because actually you will set the pace. The second thing I would say is uh, uh, th there is an issue of, um, uh, let me make the, integration is not necessarily merging. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, one should be very careful. No, I'm, I work in Costa Rica a lot, and Costa Rica, I love Costa Ricans uh, deeply. There are 3.5 million people, or 4 million. So absolutely, you know, uh, convergence is integration. <laughs> and a single payer in a country 1.3 billion people with I don't know I think it's 14 languages and dialects and I mean cultures just integration is likely to be a virtual uh, convergence where you begin to have uh, similar rules similar packages similar um, so there is portability probably across all these I think the third dimension to that and we can talk about a lot about that uh, the third dimension is, is a convergence really taking care of the incentives. So if you look at Colombia and you look at the relationship of the contributory and non-contributory schemes in Colombia, which of course, as, as Joe said, I aspire, I think the most efficient way in the long run in the Paradise Island is that we are all publicly funded. Some of our countries will take some time to be there. We are not going to be Norway uh, in one day. Uh, so if, if we have this mix, then being very careful that the convergence will not upset your incentives, that, you know, if your package are the same, what is the incentive for the formal sector to one contribute and second continue to be formal uh, and so on and so forth. So convergence probably means, um, you know, similar payment systems, uh, a lot of coordination on provided contracting so there is no cannibalism and there is no uh, unnecessary uh, competition, but is probably likely to need to preserve the uh, differential incentives. Uh, um, I think the, the fourth, and this is probably the one that I'm going to get a lot of tomatoes. Uh, uh, <laughs> so the question is, what is the justification of having multiple publicly financed schemes uh you know fully publicly financed schemes um you know you can decentralize a single one so i i think there is an issue there and a big question about regressivity of a certain uh publicly fully publicly financed uh, schemes that have very significantly uh, rich uh packages versus the other publicly financed schemes that don't, don't. I prefer not to name uh, names because I still want to get my visa when I can travel back to India. But I think there is a need to have that conversation. 
And then let me end out by saying, I, I completely agree with Joe. I think the virtual integration of, of all the sort of the back office part of it, the, the information systems, the eligibility, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, I hope that uh, your session on DRGs and NHA and PMJ really will be super powerful because as I said before, the, you know, the role of PMJ, I see it very similar to the enormous impact that uh, Medicare and Medicaid had in the US transformation of provider payments. Back to you, I hope I, I attempted to answer your question. Thanks, thanks, Estian. You did, as always. And as always, you still will get the visa because you didn't named anybody. Uh, so now I, I have the privilege of, you know, inviting Dr. Vinod Paul. Uh, you know, uh, I think all of you know him, so I don't need to introduce him, but it's my duty because, you know, it's not that I'm introducing him just as a very senior person who is the member health of Niti Aayog from India and who is one of the key person who actually was designing the whole PMJ concept and getting it approved, not designing is one part, but as a as a public health expert, you can design many things, but getting it approved also and, and actually making everybody understand that you know how important this is. I think he's one of the key person behind it. He also is responsible for one of the very big reforms in the Indian medical education system, where he actually he did some tremendous job, which I think in many years we will see the results of that. And on COVID, also I think on the whole pandemic thing, he was one of the driving force behind a lot of things which the country has done. And uh, I will, he has more than 400 publications and all. I will not say all that, but I will say he's like a guru, you know. He's like a guru, not only to the country, but to me also. And uh, I'm very privileged to invite him. Uh, and especially in the end, because he has heard everybody. And of course he can summarize, but more than that, I think we are looking forward to hear his thoughts because I think now he's also getting a little bit restless to go beyond PMJ in the sense that we have done something for three years. Now what's next? So Dr. Paul, please, thank you. Thank you very much, Nishant, and good evening. Uh, distinguished colleagues, thank you so much for uh, this master class. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, you know, the group who have given their presentations and discourses couldn't have been better. We are very proud and very, very grateful. And I extend my gratitude on behalf of uh, the government of India and my organization uh, as the think tank of the nation for, for, for exciting, so many ideas and bringing it uh, up, up to speed, so to say. So thank you, Indy. Thank you so much and distinguished friends, uh, we are connected. Uh, and as Nishant said, uh, and people uh, from time to time indicated, you know, um, we are truly now in a stage where we would like to see the next phase unfolding for, for Jayishman Bharat as a whole, but in particular today for the Pradhan Mantri Janaroga Yojana. I essentially have four reflections to make. They are part learning, part reflections, or thoughts for future action. Firstly, I think something that has come out very powerfully, and uh, Team NHA, Team India, we must start addressing the issue of quality. Uh, I think we, our systems, our SOPs, our tools on quality, uh, need to 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 really build up uh, some board to be borrowed, some to be devised, some to be you know innovated. I think this is uh, one big lesson that I would like us to 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 take away in today's meeting. And thank you um, for pointing this out, and thank you, Vinny, for saying so. And you may recall, Nishant and colleagues, that you know when we were looking at various models, then the model uh, of of China where you know things improved, but then we would see these pictures of over, you know, overwhelming uh, you know medicalized version of uh, healthcare. And this true reminder today that start thinking about quality, start implementing the tools. And it's not about you know intent, it's about tools, it's about systems, it's about science of quality. Uh, so I think that's my big learning today, and that cannot wait for us to devise that, you know, PMJ version 2.0 or 2.5 or whatever. Quality must, going forward, quality is so critical, quality of healthcare is so critical for, for our nation, for our SDG goals, and truly to meet the aspirations of people, both primary care, secondary care, preventive care, 
uh, in all facets, all facets. So I think that's my big, big uh, call, as I would say, coming from dear colleagues that you, you have joined today with us. My second uh, reflection is really very interesting thoughts around, uh, you know, drugs and medicines and linkages with private sector, participation of private sector uh, in that game and health and wellness center, you know, that space. I would say in terms of the policy design, for us, this is a very, very, I would say perhaps the most important area. And uh, your thoughts are very useful. Uh, what I want to add to those uh, deliberations are perhaps two points. One, yes, uh, uh, there are health and wellness centers, but there are, everybody is not going to health and wellness centers. We still have devised, we have not devised how to ensure that everybody passes through that system. That's our aspiration, but we are so far away from this. And also the point has been made that are our health and wellness centers op optimally resourced? And the point is again a question. What is Nishant should be the optimum budget of a health and wellness center to meet all the healthcare needs of the 12 packages? We don't know. We give what we have but we don't necessarily have designed it at the moment with that level of sufficiency, optimality, but time has come that we start talking about this. How many anti-diabetic drugs must be available, uh, for example, uh, and so on. And the aspiration to have diagnostic tests goes often beyond the malaria tests and hemoglobin and so on. There is so much more aspiration. People of India, you have seen, uh, they want their heart surgeries to be done, cleft palates to be repaired, tumors to be removed, and so on and so forth. So, so when you look at that, the expectation from a poorly, or let's say less than optimal funded and resourced health and wellness center will then come in the way uh, of the ultimate goals of uh, universal health coverage. So I'm reminded today by all of you that uh, what about this important aspect? And you very rightly pointed out uh, the private sector presence in the primary care space and how are we figuring that out? And the, it is there to be to, to stay. And there comes the primary health care models of urban and peri-urban areas, if not the rural areas, where I'm not talking about, you know, I'm not talking about informal providers. No, I'm talking about trained providers, absolutely well-trained providers, uh, doctors and nurses and so on. Uh, and they are there in certain uh, geo many geographies. And how do we connect them to the system? And I think examples of how to create that connect would be very fascinating. You know, uh, when we were doing PMJ, Aishman Bharat, we would visualize NHS, close our eyes and visualize NHS and visualize the GP's office. And we would say, that's the health and wellness center I'm looking at. But then it has imperatives. It doesn't come free, it comes with training, it comes with people who have done MBBS for six years and then five years of family health training. We have to create those pathways. So thank you for exciting us in this direction. And thank you for reminding us that the private sector, part of the care in the primary health care space is important. And here, two more points linked to this one. One is we, in COVID, we have seen the, the explosion of telemedicine. And I wonder, if we interpose high quality standardized, high quality standardized, highly accessible telemedicine, which is quality controlled, quote unquote quality controlled, which by the way would also mean that it is not taken away by the app makers and the private sector, you know, the e-health guys. So I'm saying the standard, reliable, things that are audited, trained people, SOP driven e-health, which is overseen, in a systematic manner, that kind of telemedicine can perhaps help us provide primary care without having to depend physically to go there. And then once it is standardized in that manner, the prescription can flow and the drugs can be delivered at home. So we create a path, A, for accessing primary health care for conditions which are amenable to telehealth or to the extent that they're amenable to telehealth which is standardized, then link it to delivery of drugs to the, to the families in a rational way. 
in a certain way. And I think that is the design that we may like to explore uh, straight, you know, rather than, so, so create pathways of that consultation and then medicines being delivered either on a subsidized cost or in a certain way uh, to, to the people and that would therefore tackle and then home collection of blood samples. It's possible. We have seen this in COVID also in many states who did that. So I'm wondering whether this the interposing, interposing telemedicine into the game in diff, thinking slightly differently may actually give us part of the solution to the, 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 the drugs and diagnostics related out-of-pocket expenses as well as the primary health care of a standardized kind. That's my second thought. My third two issues are, one is the challenge of how we now enlarge beyond the 50% potential coverage of the PNJ. We have a 50% coverage in a, in a, in a notional sense um, that is uh, assured. How do we now start to move up? And there, I think your ideas about merging and enlarging are highly useful. We look forward to the models of how to do it, the non-queer poor participation coming from taxes, sorry, the non-poor coming from, you know, self sort of supported in a way, uh, resource and for the poor, for the tax money. So this is a space which is for active discussion. And I'm sure as we move into this, as Bipul said, we would be very pleased to look at your advice. My last point is, again, a reminder for all of us. I think the, the need for research, need for for data from the ground with, uh, with, with, with research questions in mind. There's a passive data which you analyze in a certain way and get the best of it. But then we must also ask questions, research question deliver, driven research, high quality UHC research, I think is very critical because otherwise we will continue to base our decisions on empiric information quote unquote expert advice, national from people like us and global for people like yours, we need to, to add the, the high quality, high quality systematic uh, research into this. And I think that is where NHA should carve out a resource and create mechanisms and be open to, to hear um, the reality from the ground in cogent, quantitative, and qualitative terms. So four points, one on quality, our challenge to take it forward. Some thoughts, you excited us on the primary healthcare connect and drugs and medicines. And we are saying telemedicine, private sector, I think that space you opened up for discussion. Challenge of enlarging the scope. And lastly, the need and commitment to conduct relevant, quality, timely research in the area of UHC. These are my takeaways. And uh, again, once again, thank you so very much for this wonderful interaction. And we look forward to more of this in the near future. Thank you so much. Namaste. Thank you, Dr. Paul. And just I want to thank Dr. Paul always for your you know, very insightful comments. And I think giving these very, very nice summary also of these major issues to raise. So it's already late than what we had anticipated. And thanks a lot to all the panelists that who stayed back in spite of their many things. So uh, thank you very much. And it was really an enriching session for me personally. And I think for everybody who heard it and we have also recorded so we can make use of it in the future also for people who missed joining it today. Uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to more interaction in the future as Dr. Paul said, and have a great day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.